Panapel. I'm from uh, Illinois University of Technology and um, I will talk about uh, 3.5 tandem solar cells based on epitaxial material, um, ultra high efficient solar cells um, which are supposed to um, be or to succeed this Chocolate Kaiser limit. Um, yeah, just to introduce all people who have contributed to all this work here. This is uh, the author list, um, in particular Oliver Soupy, who did a lot of experiments, uh, postdoc, and uh, it's a co a joint work of Technical University of Ilmenau, which is basically in the middle of Germany, ex pretty exactly. Um, the Helmholtz Center Berlin for Materials and Energy, um, Cambridge University, Matthias May, a postdoc uh, who went there, um, and uh, the California Institute of Technology, uh, Achim Leverenz, Achim Leverenz, he's working there, and Fraunhofer Eser, um, Sebastian Brückner, he went from my group to Fraunhofer recently. So, the point is, uh, it's um, about um, very high performance solar cell records, solar cells, and also water splitting record devices, um, which are able to succeed the 30% limit of uh, Shockley Kreiser. So, the current record of uh, our uh, solar cell, it's a four junction solar cell, is uh, at around 500 suns at 46% efficiency. And uh, we also have uh, lately, recently, a new record for uh, direct water splitting, artificial photosynthesis, uh, with an efficiency of 13% published and realized. Um, the second point I would like to address, and this is most of the work which we are doing, uh, is about interfaces. We are watching interfaces in detail, and I just want to show you that this is very important. And one very good example is uh, the uh, breakthrough technology of 3.5 um, and silicon um, integration. This means to grow 3.5 without defects or with um, um, just little defects on silicon and to get a competitive, cheap and very efficient solar cell. And for this, I will show atomic scale analysis is uh, very helpful and, and, and advantageous. Um, yeah, critical point which we are addressing here is um, watching the material science, as I was telling, in detail, uh, really thinking um, and uh, measuring uh, atoms at these very delicate interfaces. Um, then, in, in addition, there's topics about the physics of solar cells, uh, how to exceed uh, the chocolate Kweiser limit, this 30% limit, how to realize third generation photovoltaics, and uh, how to create perfect tandem cells. You will afterwards also hear about thin film tandem solar cells from IBM. Um, so, um, it's about physical chemistry, chemical physics, uh, maximizing the chemical potentials. This is our water splitting record device here, and uh, there is a lot of different issues um, about uh, chemistry, physical chemistry. Uh, one point is, of course, to uh, get a high voltage, to split, get a high um, so-called Fermi level splitting here to create enough chemical energy of electrons and holes. Um, without having uh, losses at the interfaces. I also hope to come to this point. And uh, there's even more aspects, of course, about optical management. Um, the point I would like to stress here is uh, to get really to record de devices and also uh, to um, improvement of the whole system, which means the output of uh, modules in the field, it uh, is really important exactly to watch the atomic scale arrangement at the interface, of course, also of the bike material. Uh, so, a growing defect-free material, um, growing interfaces to proceed as good as possible to realize the high efficiency concept. This is the point. What we have to have is a kind of uh, um, direction from atomic scale arrangement towards uh, the device. And one um, very important point here is the interfaces. 
Um, yeah, we learned this already many times. Uh, Herbert Krömer, uh, who was uh, or who, uh, yeah, who got the Nobel um, Prize, um, he was um, already stressing th this here and saying the interface is the device. Uh, and this was already um, in uh, another phrase told by uh, Wolfgang Pauli, God made the bulk, the surface was invented by the devil. Um, and uh, very recently in Nature Materials, uh, in the editorial, they are saying the interface is still the device. So there is a lot of um, initiative and motivation towards the interface. So this is a guidance to uh, this talk I would like to uh, uh, give. Uh, first, of course, we have the challenge, the task, the idea, how to get highly efficient uh, solar energy conversion. And we have a kind of a concept. Um, to realize this, the most important thing is um, the electronic structure of the semiconductor. Uh, this is a general idea how to develop new devices, novel, uh, materials uh, for uh, um, application. Second point is, and these are kind of um, uh, yeah, interacting of course, yeah, which kind of materials do we have to realize such an electronic structure of um, this uh, semiconductor material. And I will tell that it is not just one material, we need different materials for the different functionalities in our device. Uh, then we have to say, uh, after having found the material, how can we prepare this? Uh, how can we do this? Uh, the preferred method I will tell about is uh, the preparation via chemical vapor deposition. Um, in this ambient, it will be really a challenge to watch. Um, the analysis, the interface analysis, this is the last point, not just, of course, uh, the interface, but also the bulk material, the optoelectronic um, properties of our materials. Uh, so coming to the first task here, um, um, yeah, usually we are thinking about standard PV, uh, mostly um, silicon-based, and um, this is a flat plate module. Um, in um, contrast to this, uh, it is also possible, of course, to uh, work uh, with concentrator photovoltaics. Yeah? There is different issues which make it attractive uh, to do this, and I will show this. Yeah? Um, one, of course, is that we need a much smaller cell area yeah, than for flat plate PV. In particular, if the solar cell area is expensive, yeah, then it is highly attractive to do this. Yeah, and just to tell a number at a very high efficiency, as I will tell, yeah, and uh, assuming a concentration factor of a thousand, yeah, we would just need 10 by 10 square kilometer solar cell material, active solar cell area, to drive this whole planet with enough energy, uh, about 15 terawatts. Uh, you can show this, and this uh, is really a small piece uh, uh, compared to the big task we have, uh, task number one on this planet. And so it looks like uh, th these are uh, um, CPV modules, a test field, and the good thing is, of course, you can also use the land area uh, in addition to um, the area using for um, solar energy conversion. Yeah, and this is the point. Usually we do have a lot of losses. Uh, losses are uh, thermalization losses. This we see here. If we excite or create an electron hole pair, we have a lot of losses uh, due to uh, thermal um, thermalization of the charge carriers, electrons and holes. This is the first big source of losses. Uh, the second big source of losses, inherent losses, which we cannot avoid, uh, is transmission losses. All um, photons, all light energy, below the band gap cannot be absorbed and this is just a loss. To 
overcome this, yeah, there is a straightforward uh, technology or um, idea. This is the multi-junction idea. Uh, here we have a kind of successive absorption of light from high energy to low energy and we uh, reduce all these losses, either the thermalization losses and also this transmission losses here. Uh, this is the challenge, the idea, so we have this. Next is to watch the electronic structure. Uh, the electronic structure is very important. This is a kind of textbook picture, but it is also like it is in reality. What we basically need is uh, different band gaps uh, to have uh, the absorption of different photons. Then, very important, uh, we have to create these different chemical potentials of holes and electrons in both subcells. But in addition, we have to have more. Uh, for example, here, this tunnel junction. I will talk about this also. This is a very nice part of the solar cell. It's quantum mechanical tunneling of charge carriers through this junction here. Uh, so just to stress this uh, complex picture here, what we see is the increase of potential theoretical efficiency by the increase of the number of subsets. Yeah, this was a two-junction solar cell, but of course we can go to three and four-junction solar cell. This is the last um, or the latest record cell we have. Yeah. Um, we have several advantages besides um, reducing the solar cell area we usually would need. Yeah. In addition, we can increase the theoretical efficiency since uh, the electric power, the output of our solar cell is proportional to the logarithm of the concentration times the concentration. Uh, and since uh, this is an addition, uh, an additional value we have. The efficiency, the conversion efficiency, is proportional to the logarithm of the concentration. Yeah, just you can see this easily by the open circuit voltage, uh, um, um, the diode equation at open circuit voltage. And what you can see is that you increase the theoretical efficiency under 1.5. AM 1.5 spectrum, the blue curve here, and the red curve is under maximum concentration of 46,200 suns. Yeah, usually, and this is, uh, these are the best values currently achieved on uh, yeah, the, the record cells. And it is all 3.5 based solar cells. Yeah. And you have to compare these values basically with this curve yeah, since we are at concentrations in the range of 500 to 1,000 suns. And then uh, you have to watch basically this theoretical efficiency here since this is uh, the uh, logarithm dependence as I was showing from the concentration. Yeah. So next point is which materials do we have to, to realize these nice ideas? Yeah. And this is the landscape involving uh, epitaxial materials, silicon, germanium, and 3,5 semiconductors. Um, of course, there is some more, but basically what we see here is um, that, uh, uh, the, hard to see here, but uh, um, uh, I think hardly we can uh, recognize the high band gaps. We have, for example, in, in this case, which we are missing in other technologies, uh, high mobility, direct band gaps, uh, good um, preparation of heterostructures and uh, industrial preparation of optoelectronic devices. This is advantages we have. Disadvantage is, of course, that it, this material is pretty expensive. Yeah. So, and to reduce this, it would be great to bring uh, it together with silicon. The silicon technology, of course, had, has all uh, so a lot of advantages here. And uh, there is uh, a historical task to grow three fives on silicon. And one uh, challenging point is the task of polar, since these materials are all partially polar. Um, Exact, in particular at the 100 surface um, on non-polar material. Of course, uh, this is just covalent bondings here, and this is a non-polar material. Yeah? 
And uh, yeah, this is even more you can do besides the band gap. You can also separately tune the valence and conduction band offsets. Um, yeah, this is important in, for, in particular if you want to uh, address uh, specific energy levels like the redox levels for uh, hydrogen and water uh, or oxygen and water. I will come to this point later. Uh, so, and this makes it possible also to realize the appropriate band gaps of a four junction cell with optimized band gaps. These are optimized band gaps for a multi junction solar cell um, with um, four junctions uh, with band gaps of 0 0.7, 1 0.0, 0 0.4, and 1.9 EV. And this is exactly what we proposed, suggested, and did. Uh, and this cell here, which is rather for absorption and conversion of the infrared part of the sun spectrum, this we developed newly. And um, another task in this field of which kind of materials do we have, of course, is to watch the virtue of T5 and silicon combination. What you can see here is the variation of the top T5 band gaps and the bottom the silicon, for example, in this line here, we are at 1.12 EV band gap, the silicon band gap, and what you can see, you can, um, by combination of the silicon band gap and a top cell band gap in the range of 1.6 to 1.7 EV, you are almost in the bull's eye of the highest efficiencies. Huh? And uh, this is also not for solar energy conversion, the optimum band gaps. It's also for water splitting, direct water splitting, the optimum band gaps within this corridor here. I can show this uh, maybe I have time later. Uh, so next point is how to prepare this. Uh, the preparation is possible with different techniques, uh, like physical vapor deposition in the state-of-the-art technology, it's molecular beam epitaxy, or um, chemical vapor deposition environment, in particular, in this case, metal organic chemical vapor deposition. Uh, this is a really complex environment with a lot of ingredients here. We have the carrier gas, with, which is hydrogen and is really important for the interaction with uh, the surface. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of uh, ingredients like the precursor molecules for the uh, different um, uh, yeah, materials. We would like to absorb here three valent and five valent uh, materials. So there is a lot of action. But this is the industrial scalable technology here we see a reactor with 19 times 4 inch wafers. So this is that state of the art technology to produce, for example, also LEDs on the state of the art level. Um, but it is difficult to combine this with, with uh, science. I will show how to do this. Uh, um, later, just watching the task uh, which we have here to grow here, very homogeneous and very reproducible, high standard material, and uh, there is delicate um, layers and interfaces. Uh, for example, in this tunnel junction, we have uh, layers which are in the range of 10 nanometer, so they have to be very exact. Uh, and just to show the functionality, what we have is the um, uh, yeah, excitation of electrons and hold pairs in the different uh, cells, uh, like here in the top cell and the bottom cell of this infrared tandem. And afterwards, uh, charges are traveling. They are recombining perfectly in the um, uh, tunnel junction on an isoenergetically. And in addition, um, they have to be guided, directed in the appropriate directions. So this is the um, yeah, functionality of such a tandem solar cell. And this is uh, this low band gap solar cell which we have developed and uh, which uh, recently got uh, reached, achieved an efficiency of 46% at 500 suns. And uh, what you can see here is the contour plot of uh, the variation of these band gaps. Uh, and we are also here almost in the bull's eye 
you know, of the efficiency and you see that theoretically uh, we can achieve more than 60% conversion efficiency. Practically, there is, it should be possible to get efficiencies beyond 50% with uh, such an optimized uh, um, for junction cells. So we are, are at the beginning of the development to use this, to uh, utilize this perfectly. So next point here is the interface analysis. Uh, this is, I like this very much. Uh, it shows us the difficulty which we have. Uh, what we have to do is to know about the interfaces between these different layers here. Um, of course, it's difficult to watch the interface in such a cake uh, since uh, finally you have somehow to cut it and to watch in between the layers. So it will be very difficult. And in particular, if it's very important, uh, how exactly these buried interfaces look like. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, I have already told about this very complex environment here, chemically uh, really vivid. And um, to watch this, we utilize uh, the uh, in situ spectroscopy method of the so-called reflection anisotropy spectroscopy. This is a little inconvenient, this technology, yeah, um, since it's not intuitively understandable, but it rewards. If you go into that, yeah, you really learn a lot. Uh, and this is the point I would like to uh, convey. Uh, basically, it's uh, ellipsometry in normal incidence. What you have here, you are measuring the reflectance of the light, which is linearly polarized. And afterwards, you get an elliptic polarization, which you analyze. And this gives you all the information about um, many, many different points um, of this interface. Yeah? It's uh, telling you basically everything, the electronic structure, the morphology on the microscopic and mesoscopic scale. It tells you also about the bulk. The difficulty is if one spectroscopy method is telling you too much, it's hard to understand it. Yeah? So, and how do, do, do we understand it? This is the point. We are measuring the signals. You can, uh, um, yeah, this is basically the analytics of this signal. Uh, the difference of the reflection, as I was telling, divided by the normalized uh, total reflection. And uh, if you regard this just as a fingerprint, uh, then you can benchmark this with other methods, which we do in our lab. Uh, we combine this technology here with a contamination free transfer to ultra high vacuum. Then we shuttle our sample with this ultra high vacuum carrier. This is a UHV suitcase practically to all the different methods like um, low energy electron deflection, scanning tunnel microscopy, uh, electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis, and so on. And after having learned this, we can associate these in situ signals directly with all which we have learned from here. And this is basically what we do. Uh, I will show you this on the example of T5 on silicon. Uh, this is the task we have. In silicon, we have the diamond lattice, uh, uh, just covalent bondings here. And in uh, three fives, we have the zinc plane um, structure. And now we have to combine this. And there is some challenge to do this. Yeah. One challenge we see already here. Yeah. If we grow the 3-5 on so-called double atomic steps, yeah. you see this is double atomic steps, one, two atomic layers. Yeah. Also here, one, two atomic layers. Everything is fine. Yeah. But if we grow this on so-called single atomic steps. This is a single atomic step. Yeah. Then we have a lot of wrong bondings, so-called anti-phase boundaries, which are a kind of walls of defects going through our crystal. Yeah. And you see here the, the polarity changes. Here we have uh, the phosphorus down and the um, gallium on the upper position. Here it's the other way around. Yeah. Gallium is down, um, phosphorus is at the upper position. So this is kind of what we would like to um, exclude. Uh, 
And how do we control this? As I was telling, we use uh, the reflectance anisotropy spectroscopy technology techniques, measurement techniques, uh, to watch exactly the um, step formation. How do we do this? We get this signal. This is a signal from a single domain surface, terrace. Yeah. And um, afterwards, yeah, we compare this to the measurement of a two domain surface where we have two different orientations of the surface reconstruction yeah, due to changing um, the um, surface reconstruction by single atomic steps. Uh, and here we have double atomic steps. And now we can basically quantify the domain ratio just by the strength of this signal. Uh, and this is what we do. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, here we can basically identify the signal uh, measured exactly here at this energy. Uh, and we can see the oscillation of the terrace uh, just by measuring the signal at uh, in situ during um, hydrogen. Um, uh, yeah, the, usually, if the sample is in the MOCVD reactor, we have a lot of hydrogen around the sample. Uh, and this hydrogen edges the sample, and this we can see basically by uh, the development of the um, terrace coverage, either by um, dimers oriented parallel or perpendicular to the surface. And so we can see this etching process basically by oscillation of this in situ signal. Uh, just to show you another example here. Uh, what we basically see is that the hydrogen coverage changes either by pressure of the hydrogen or and by the temperature of the surface. Uh, and we can see here the change from 100% to 0% hydrogen coverage within a small range of temperature changes. Uh, and this gives us the idea how exactly on the surface this um, etching process just due to um, creating vacancies by hydrogen um, etching of the surface and movement of the um, atoms on the surface. Yeah? And so we can explain basically that we have the development of an unusual um, surface reconstruction which is just driven kinetically by the hydrogen gas um, on the surface. Uh, so we have to see and to summarize that it is very important to watch the surface and to see um, these um, processes uh, which we could not guess if we do, wouldn't watch this in situ. Uh. So just to show you, uh, this is our normal lattice if we have a surface reconstruction. Uh, as I was telling, we have the interaction with hydrogen this hydrogen sticks on the surface. We get these silicon dimers where in each dimer we have monohydrides um, of silicon hydrogen bonds here. And afterwards we grow the 3,5 material also at, uh, passivated by hydrogen on the surface. This is what we all uh, published and have seen. Yeah. And then we can identify exactly these surfaces by these in situ signals. And this is the techniques how to follow exactly the reconstruction and the build, uh, how th this surface is built. And um, finally, uh, what we do now is we have this surface. Uh, we have the appropriate in situ signal exactly to this surface, uh, so we can see it. Uh, in the next step now, yeah, and we can control it and we can improve it and so on uh, in situ. Next step is now we grow our material, yeah, this gallium phosphide surface, which we also know in detail, where we also have the in situ signal. Yeah, we can see how it is oriented and in which quantity these dimers are um, uh, arranged. Uh, and from this, 
Uh, we can deduce afterwards to the buried interface, which you basically want to know. Uh, so, how is time? Do I have another two minutes? Yeah, very good. Uh, this was the first example, 3.5 on silicon, how to control it. Uh, just to stress it once more, it's a very important um, point to bring these two material systems together. This would not only improve solar energy conversion devices, but also the whole optoelectronic um, industry. This is a little bo bit more in the future. Uh, the artificial photosynthesis, we have yesterday already heard about this. Uh, just to tell uh, this task again, we have uh, the challenge to split water, uh, to um, have or to supply the energy uh, between this um, hydrogen and um, proton redox level and also this oxygen water redox level, which is 1.23 eV. Uh, in addition, we have to overcome this by the so-called overpotentials. And in addition, of course, we have to regard the chemical uh, potentials of electrons and holes. This brings us all to the conclusion that we could not use a lot of light with a single absorption layer. So what we need is, again, a tandem. Uh, to do this highly efficient, and this is what we currently uh, are, are realizing with partners, um, and what we have done uh, is to realize um, a device uh, which is not at the uh, um, has not achieved the theoretical efficiency. Uh, what we can see here is again the um, um, theoretical efficiency of water splitting by changing the different band gaps of the bottom and top um, subcell of a water splitting tandem device. Uh, and uh, exactly this here we have realized 14%. Um, we can see that we can uh, get more to the bull's eye where efficiencies beyond 20% should be possible. Uh, and this is how it looks like. This is the uh, um, uh, yeah, hydrogen producing uh, um, um, electrochemical device here, a tandem, um, and this tandem uh, looks like this. We have a uh, top cell indium gallium phosphide and a bottom cell gallium indium arsenide. Uh, with this band gap combination, it is possible to um, overcome the um, energy or to, to split water, to supply enough energy to split water by the um, separation of uh, the Fermi levels here. We see from here to here we have voltages uh, be beyond 2.2 eV, which is uh, necessary to split water here at the cathodic process. We have rhodium. Uh, and again, it is very important here, last point, yeah, to watch the interface, which we also do. Yeah. And so I finally would like to conclude this talk. I have shown uh, the um, uh, strategy and the challenges to develop these record devices. Uh, I have shown how to create T5 on silicon growth. And finally, I would like to um, thank all who contributed to this talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.